the way that you like to be introduced to us. Um, we have Yovanka also, a writer, and uh, Justin Musa as well. I, I, al I always find that I love to hear introductions from the person themselves and the way that they like to be introduced. Um, and Justin Musa, if I speak too fast, just let me know. <laughs> Welcome so much. Um, how, how do you like to be known? Thank you for, for welcoming and thank you for uh, welcoming to the festival and those are here, early birds. Um, you, well, I will introduce myself, but you, you, you picked the right words. I'm a translator, but I am a writer. I mean, any translation, they, they are my words. I have written them, and if I wasn't a good writer, I could be a brilliant linguist, but you have to be a good writer to, to, to translate. So I'm a, a writer and a translator. And an editor, yes, we've got some of the, the, the books here. I did translate these ones, but the, the, I, uh, I'm an editor for the, for the imprint with Yovanka as well, called Daedalus Africa. But I'm also a bit of an agent, really. If I, uh, translators are often work like this, if you find an author that you like and want to translate, you often have to make the effort of getting hold of the book, reading it, doing a sample translation, finding a publisher, trying to interest them. And that doesn't just mean making the sample translation brilliant, but also persuading them there's a market, maybe finding them some possible funding uh, avenues. So yeah, it's writer, translator, in this case, editor and agent. And to finish the introduction, uh, I am from England, I'm from a city in the north called Sheffield, but I now live in Lisbon. Uh, and I have also lived in, in Brazil, so uh, Portuguese uh, comes from Brazil and, uh, and Lisbon, but I also translate Spanish, so I've translated uh, two novels from Ecuador, Guinea, which is the only sort of uh, official Spanish-speaking uh, country, although it technically uh, is in the League of Portuguese-speaking nations, even though it's not really a, a true. Welcome, Jethro. And Jethro has also translated um, The Mad Woman of Serrano um, from Cape Verde by Dina Salusio. And there'll be a session later on this evening around that, so make sure you stick around. Welcome, Yvonne. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my name is Yovanka Fakit Pizigam, and I usually introduce myself as a writer from Guinea Bissau. Uh, I was born in Portugal, but I've lived in Ivory Coast mostly in Senegal, and moved to London. I've been living there for the past 10 years. <laughs> and then I basically started to get into translation, and that's how I actually met Jethro. Um, I started to, uh, as a writer, going to literature events in London, and then realized that uh, even though they, most of the events called themselves African, there was no representation of Lucifer Africa. So that's how my interest in translation started. I realized there wasn't a lot of work translating into English. And yeah, so I'm a writer, translator, and you know, all around cheerleader for Miss Fun Africa. Welcome, Yvonne. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Jesse Musi Cassina. Uh, I'm from Mozambique. I, I am a publisher, specifically a publisher and a journalist. I'm running a publishing house called The Atale. Uh, it's a publishing house uh, which is doing specific two things. One is to discover new voices for Mozambican literature. And the second thing is to republish some classical African books uh, published specifically between 1980 to 1990. And we also uh, translate some African books that does not exist in Portuguese. My interest is different. <laughs> Yovanka is uh, taking books from Portuguese to English and we are taking books from another language to Portuguese because uh, in Mozambique as well, in Angola, 
many readers do not know all about african literature written in another language they also knows african literature written in portuguese as well uh, brazilian and portuguese literature thank you thank you justin Jose. so today it's the first session of macondo literary festival and this is a session about trends, stories, writers. It's a, a little introduction into the Lucifone space. Um, a few years ago, perhaps, maybe a couple of years ago on Twitter, a trend started around if your African country was uh, someone at the bar, I think. Do you remember? Does anyone remember it? Yeah. You remember it? Yes. Uh, and, and what what would you what would your African country be in the bar? Would they be the drunkard by the side? Would they be the girl getting down on the dance floor? And it spurred off this like pan African conversation. So I would like to ask you, each of you, from your experience in the literary space that you are part of, if if you were able to describe it, if we were to walk in and get dropped in the middle. What are people interested in reading about? What are the writers interested in writing about? What does the space feel like um, to somebody who has, has no interaction with it before, as if I, as if I were an alien? Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a really hard question. <laughs> um, so what would this space look like? I think it's um well i can speak for maybe for guinea bissau and just also why the use of africa i think the space what, what it looks like is people are actually still um there's a lack of knowledge about how to actually enter literature spaces even within use of africa and especially in guinea bissau um there's also a, a feeling of feeling invisible um so just the other day i actually shared the miles more than scholarship with some writers from Guinea Bissau and most of them were emailing back and saying, oh, but I don't have a work translated into English, so how can I access, how can we benefit from these things? Um, but the kind of stories I think people are still telling or talking about have a lot to do with our, the Guinea Bissau's past. Um, so I think as a nation, we're still trying to grapple with our colonial post-colonial past. And um, we have actually the novel, the first novel to be translated into English from Guinea South by Chetro, uh, right here by Abdullah Sila. It's called The Ultimate Tragedy, which actually ha is um, a tale basically of colonialism uh, about a woman trying to choose between two men and what they represent. Um, and I think these are so, still some of the stories we're telling and talking about. And we haven't quite moved into telling more modern his stories. So for example, um, I'm from Guinea Bissau. I left at the age of six in 1998 because of the Civil War. And like many of my counterparts, um, most of us actually live in the diaspora. A lot of us are highly educated, speak several languages, French, English, Russian, Spanish. And we live across Europe, the US, and, and other places in Africa. And even though there's large communities of people from Guinea-Bissau, um, I can just say, like, I'm from London, if you go to Hackney, you will definitely hear Creole from Guinea-Bissau. Uh, if you go to Senegal, there's large communities, uh, people getting together, food, celebrations. But we don't have writing that talks about these experiences of being from Guinea-Bissau and moving to the U.S. post the conflict. We don't have stories about what it means to be black British, but coming from Guinea Bissau. We don't have also stories about what does it mean to come from a country that most of us have not been able to go back because there are not many opportunities because of political um, issues. Um, what it also means, particularly for me, um, it's been quite of a struggle when I say I'm from Guinea Bissau, most people actually don't know <laughs> where Guinea Bissau is. And, you know, I get a lot of questions like, um, are you from Papua New Guinea? You know, so people have no, you know, I've even spoken with Nigerians and uh, 
they'll be like, is that, is that Africa? And I'm like, yes, it's on the same side as you. Um, and they'll be like, oh, so you speak French, right? I'm like, no, Portuguese Africa. Um, so there's just also this burden of representing and explaining constantly, and lots of people see it as almost coming from an exotic part of Africa, and questions about, oh, do, is everybody look like you? Is it, is it really an African country? And I also find that there's a lot of um, times where people sort of have this idea that in Lucifer Africa, our experience with colonialism was more, um, more peaceful. Because lots of people have this impression that because there's a lot of, they meet a lot of people that are either light skinned or mixed race, mixed with uh, Portuguese, that it must mean that you know racism is something that we don't, we didn't experience, or that all the Portuguese. I often have been told, oh, but the Portuguese were fairly nice colonizers, um, because you know they made so many babies, and you know they might have. So. There's actually a funny joke that says, um, what do the English leave? Administration. What do the French leave? Architecture. What do the Portuguese leave? Children. <laughs> and many of those stories are it, true, but uh, there's also a lot of tragedy in there. So for example, my grandmother, who is half Portuguese, uh, was a result of an illicit love affair, for example. Um, and many other people also have this heritage but never have had such a relationship with Portugal or even these so-called white parents. And also, you know, historically, I don't know if most people might not know, but Mozambique, Angola, Guinea-Bissau, uh, Santomé, we all actually had really long civil wars with the colonial power that is Portugal at the time, huge losses. And we're still actually recovering. We only got our independence about 30 to 35 years. And that's something that people just are still not aware. So that's, I think, the scene. And like I was saying, we haven't yet, um, I think the, we're not as developed, I would say, in terms of our <laughs> literature, because we've only got our independence. So we're still trying to understand what does that even mean. Yeah. And, and I mean, even that we're having this conversation where we're defining our parts of the continent through a European space is a tragedy. Lucifer Africa and Anglophone Africa. It's almost as if who we are and how we know each other is via another, an oppressive power. Because it's not even just another continent, it was an oppressive power. And, I, and, and you know, so much of what you say um, really resonates even as a Kenyan in trying to understand who we are sort of outside of colonialism. It feels like that's how we were defined in some ways. Um, in, in terms of um, just in the with Mozambique, one of the things that I found really interesting is the crime anthology that um, your publishing house is publishing. Uh, it sort of goes counter to the idea of, OK, let me, let me rephrase my question. <laughs> What are the sorts of things that are being written about in Mozambique? Um, and what's most interesting and exciting to you as a publisher? OK, thank you. Uh, in Mozambique, oh, the Mozambican literature has, are now divided in three uh, periods. There's a first period from 1960 to 1975. Uh, the literature of this time, the times of uh, poets such as José Graverinha and Noemi de Souza was the struggle against the colonialism. And in 1977, when the civil war uh, started between uh, Renamo Part and the governor, who were run by Frelimo, uh, the main or the part of the independence, has, they created the conditions to start a new kinds of literature. That's literature written by writers such as Gulani Bakakosa, uh, with his Walalape, and Mia Couto, as well as uh, 
João Paulo Borges Coelho and um, Eduardo White and many, many, many writers, they use it to tell another stories about the official story. Uh, you know what's happened? When Mozambique became independent, um, everybody knows that, okay, now is our time. They use it to leave the poor neighborhoods and they move it herself or themselves to the center of the seat to manage companies, to manage all things in the center of the seat. But many of that people were not prepared in terms of knowledge to manage such things. This is why the countries got down and created the condition for start new literature about new stories, new stories about the war. There was an official story that the war the war was run by Renan Parte. But when we read books such as Wallapi and such as Ukumboyu di Salasukar, Kumbo di Salasukar, okay, it's the train of salt and sugar of uh, Licinio de Azevedo, uh, books such as Mia Couto's book, we meet another stories of the war run by the official. You know what's happened? Uh, I give my confidence for you, to you protect myself against another, another one, but there is not another one who is fighting with me, but is yourself who is fighting against me. But I give you a confidence to protect me. This is what's happened at this time. And now we are living the two kinds of Mozambique. We have uh, the Mozambique of the neighborhoods and the Mozambique of the center of the seat. This is why in our collective dictionary of imagination, we have two words. One word is cidade, it means seat, and another word is neighborhood, it means bio. Uh, but the neighborhoods are within the seat, but we do not call the neighborhoods as a seat. We say, okay, I'm going to cidade or I'm going to buy. Where do you live? I live at buy. Where do you live? I live at Cidad. And the literature now, they produce it, uh, discussing about such things, such different things. We are living all in Maputo, but in Maputo we have two seats, buy and Cidad. Yes, yes, thank you, that's really interesting. Um, Jethro, uh, what are the stories that are getting privileged in terms of being translated to English? And what are we not, what's being hidden? What are we not getting access to? Um, yeah, there's, obviously I have a slightly different perspective. There's a sort of outsider looking for these stories. And um, there's kind of two sides to it. There's, there's what, which stories exist but aren't getting translated, and, and which stories just don't exist um, because, you know, you're saying it's Lusophone, Anglophone. Uh, I translate Portuguese, but as an editor, I was interested in, you know, it, it, are there stories, are there novels in Creole from Guinea-Bissau, in Cape Verde, can we maybe translate them? But they don't really exist, so I've asked, you know, uh, Cape Verdeans, Dina and, and, and other friends, and they say, no, I, I like Creole to write many poems or, or music, maybe even a short story, but no, nah, it's, not, it's, it, it's not for a novel. It, it, uh, the, the, Amilcar Cabral was quite positive about Portuguese, so maybe it's a different relationship to in some other places, but people who I would have expected, sort of writers I would have expected to champion Creole, don't. Uh, they, 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 they think it, it, the language it doesn't yet serve uh, a purpose for, for, for a novel. And what does that mean? Well, I suppose it means that the writers who are writing the stories, you know, maybe there's lots of people who don't really speak Portuguese or are not comfortable in it, uh, they're not writing stories in Creole, but realistically, would they be writing stories anyway? Probably not. The, you know, the, there are other priorities in life. Uh, when when life's hard, you're you're not thinking, oh, I'll write my novel. You're thinking, you know, food on the table, look after the kids. Um, you find, therefore, as well, whether I'm looking for work in 
Angola or Cape Verde or whatever, and you think, right, we want more women authors. And, and again, you, you don't find as many novels. Uh, again, short stories, poetry, there's, there's more options. Why would that be? I suppose, again, but to, 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 to be a practical elements to that, also barriers, are they being encouraged? Are they, you know, the, the man intellectual is obviously still gets a better platform. So yeah, there's, 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 there's difficulties on that front, uh, as in the, the, the sort of the raw materials that we as translators can, can use. Secondly, yeah, what, what, uh, as managing an, a, a publisher, we can try and do things differently. But yeah, if you send a, a story to a, a major publisher in London from, I'm going to make this up, but let's say Kinshasa, and it's about two friends, going to, they go, oh, but where's the, you know, where's the Africanness? No, it's a, it's a story in a, a city, but it's contemporary. That, no, of course, still, there's a sort of a cliched thing that, 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 that people look for or expect. I'd say that's changing a bit, uh, partly through readership uh, and economics of, of people buying books, but, uh, but yeah, expectations are still a little bit uh, stuck in the past in that sense. Thanks, Jethro. I mean, and carrying on with this idea of translation, um, it feels almost as if when it's translated to English, it is for the West, it is not for Anglophone Africa. And so it's almost like the stories that, um, that, that look out that way are the ones that get translated. Um, in, how do you think, do, do you see that changing in any way? And what would it require, do you think, to, to be able to access um, African stories in English for Africans? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, just to go off a very slight tangent, but on Jackie, who's the Angolan author here, and you know, has lived in Brazil and Lisbon, and uh, you know, is a, a very open and engaged reader and writer. He has never read Dina's book in Portuguese because he's just never seen it anywhere. So that shows that even before they're translated, this book is not finding its way to other Portuguese-speaking African countries. So there's a distribution problem at many, many sort of levels. Yovanka, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Um, for me, I actually sort of disagree a little bit because the experience I've had of sort of championing Lucifer and African literature in English-speaking African spaces, um, I can give actually an example that I was trying to um, promote this Angolan writer whose book um, is divided in three parts. And two out of the three points of view in the book are basically uh, two white people. One is a, a guy who's Norwegian, and he's a police officer, and he's talking about his relationship to music and hip hop and, and talks about immigration in Norway. Uh, the second sort of point of view was the, the daughter the stepdaughter of an Angolan man living in Lisbon who dances kizomba and you know is really in touch with African music, the African scene. And the third one was an Angolan point of view of a man traveling to Europe. And when I tried to sort of speak about and promote this book, um, some of the reactions I got actually from other Africans that speak English was that why is it, they said, they basically said, I'm looking for an authentic Lucifer an African story. And why did he choose to have two out of three uh, white people telling, being basically the principal uh, characters in, the, in his novel? And I try to explain why that, and I don't think they got it because there's this assumption as well um, when people want to publish stories from Lucifer in Africa, what they ask is, Oh, I want something authentic, something, you know, like uh, things fall up, your things are fall apart, you know, where it's just Afrocentric, it's just Africans talking to each other. And the issue is that, again, going back to colonization, um, the influence of Portugal in many of the Lucifer African countries was tremendous. And it's a very, very different experience than in other places like Nigeria, Kenya, 
in terms of how our societies were even built and even came so close together. And I think even when you go to Portugal, just in like going back to the example of this lady who was teaching Kizomba in the book, when you go to Portugal, um, for, I, and I'm not saying that you know the relationship is a specific one, but in Portugal, although they do not promote African literature, you can't even find actually a loose of an African book in most bookshops. There is this strange thing that happens that a lot of the African culture is actually being promoted by Portuguese people themselves. So Kizomba, which is a dance that's originated from Angola, dance across Lusophon Africa. If you go to Portugal, your dance teacher will be white. You know, So there's this thing, and I was basically trying to explain, for example, I, as much as I say I'm from Guinea-Bissau, I was born in Portugal. Um, my father's ancestors come, come from Coimbra, and my name, Pertigão, is an extremely Portuguese name, you know. Um, my other heritage also comes from Portugal, so as, as I was saying, my grandmother was half Portuguese, you know. So, I see myself as African, but at the same time, I have had a relationship with Portugal, with whiteness, and it's a very complicated Thing. So if I was to tell my story, I couldn't tell my story without mentioning Portugal. And as I say, it's very complicated because I lived in Portugal for many years. And funny enough, uh, I, was living with, I was raised by my grandparents in this neighborhood in Lisbon. And in that same neighborhood, my grandmother's white brothers used to live in that neighborhood. And she used to go to the same hairdresser as one of the wives of his of her brothers but they never said hello they never she never acknowledged so there's a family i guess that we have that's never acknowledged the fact that they have an african side of the family so it's really hard to talk about an authentic because our experiences are not like um, in nigeria or other places and just like actually jesse would say we also in guinea bissau have this division of bayru sidad you know, for example, I can't, I don't have a village in Guinea-Bissau. I'm actually from just a city. And lots of people are actually from Lusophon Africa. Can, or sometimes, because of your particular history, you might have been a more of a city person. So I can't write a story about being in an African village, you know, that authentic African history. So I think, for me, there is an issue where, yes, we are writing, I think, Lusophon Africa tours the West, but I don't find that there's a willingness in the African-speaking world to actually listen to Lucifer Africa. I've been living in London and going to many African festivals, and you know, I, for example, I used to work for Africa Rights. I used to go to Africa Rights many times. It's only, um, I think, about two years ago that they had Abdullah Sila, the first person from Lucifer Africa, writer that they invited. And that was, the, I think, the sixth year. And the reason why they invited him was because I insisted. <laughs> so, you know, and people say, oh, language, you know. And I'm like, I, I speak Portuguese, I speak English, I speak French. And lots of us speak, you know, you speak English, you're here. So you can find these people, you know. Thank you for sharing that, Rebecca. I think that, I mean, I'm certainly guilty of centering, you know, my Kenyan experience as the African experience and doing the same thing that I get frustrated at others for doing. Thank you for calling me out on that. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, it really is, I think for many of us here, our first introduction. And it's startling, the expectation is that there will be so much similarity and it's startling, I think, to hear where the differences lie, I suppose, is, is uh, something I'm, I'm learning in this moment. Um, just to say, I want to hear more about the stories that come out from the two spaces. Are they different? The stories that come out from the city versus from the bar? Bar? Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. I would like to beg for the question of translation. Yes, please. Oh my gosh, please, yes. Yes, because we are working on. Uh, we were running a festival in 2000. Uh, 16 uh, short story uh, 
prize were integrated in the festival in north of Mozambique. And in Maputo, uh, there are not exist more African books available in Portuguese in our bookstores. When you go to a bookstore in Maputo, you will find more uh, European or Western books than African books. This is why we use it to demand for someone who was traveling to Portugal to buy for us 10 books for 10 African authors for different countries as well, 10, uh, 10 African countries. When uh, he was at library, at bookstore in Lisbon, uh, the, books, the bookseller said that uh, we don't have many uh, African books of uh, different countries, but we have many African books from Mozambique and Angola. And okay, he said, can you buy it? When he bought, he bought 10 books, uh, seven books was by Portuguese author, who used it to live in Mozambique and Angola during the colonial times, working for colonial offices. And three was for really, really African authors. One on Jack's book and one uh, Mia Kote and Paulina Shizian's book. This thing invited us to think what we have to do to turn uh, African literature available for Mozambique spaces. And when we started thinking about, we used it to back to Portugal and say, okay, now we don't want African books, now we want translators. We want translators who can do our job to translate books from English, French, to Portuguese. This is why we started to run a, a project of translations in our publishing house. And about the stories uh, between neighborhoods and seeds, uh, we have two kinds of stories. Uh, we have uh, rural stories, uh, specifically stories written by Gulani, Miyakoto, Paulina Shiziani, uh, the stories that happen specifically in the rural spaces. And the story written by, how I can say, contemporary writers, such as Melio Tinga, Lucilio Manjati, Pedro Pereira Lopes, uh, many, many, many of these authors, the stories are happening on the seeds. And we don't have a different story between Bayo and Sidani. No, we have the same story, uh, the character moving from the Bayo to the seeds, and changing his personality to be integrated within the, in the Bible or in the Cidade. 